Hi everybody, it's Steve Gray from Super Church. Our goal here on this channel is to closely examine God's Word. And uh, we've got a fine lesson for you here today from, uh, from the end of chapter 7 of Acts. Now in our study, if you've watched the other videos, and if you haven't, you probably should, uh, to pick up the whole thread of the story. Um, in chapter 7, Stephen is, um, he's pleading for his life. He starts off, oh, he starts off kind of nice and polite. He tells some of the story of the Jews, um, but then after a bit, well, uh, he starts to get more and more pointed. Uh, he starts to get more and more agitated, and he pretty soon, he pretty much just tells them how it is. He calls them a couple of names, and so that's where we are now. He's just finished his speech, and we are going to go into this very last section in chapter 7, so please open your Bibles. If you don't have one handy, pause the video right here and go and get a Bible. Um, because we want to carefully examine this and we want to hope to uh, draw closer to God's Word through studying His Word. So, um, we're going to divide it into two sections. Uh, the first one is going to be the stoning of Stephen. So, Acts uh, 7 and verse 54, read with me. And when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. So, um, first of all, they were cut to the heart. So we're just going to kind of make a little outline here and we're going to study what the persecutors did, the people that persecuted Stephen. So uh, they were, uh, first of all, they were cut to the heart. Now this word cut, well, it's an idiom uh, and I like idioms. Um, I, I know it sounds kind of silly, uh, but I'm a student of language among other things and, and a, a couple times I've been, I tried to translate something into another language and it didn't work out so well for me. And I, I, I went, I translated something, and I said it in a, in a I, you know, I was very pleased that I knew this other language, um, and I said it, and everybody laughed. Like, oh, well, why is that funny? And they laughed for a while, and then they explained to me why what I had said was funny because it didn't translate the way I thought it would. Um, and and language is like that. So this is an idiom. Um, it's 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 not an exact phrase. They were not actually cut to the heart. Um, I mean, I think that's obvious. Now, I want to make a very careful preface here. We teach the Bible literally. There is no other way to look at the Bible except literally, word for word, all the way from the front, all the way to the back, every word literal. Because once you get in the habit of saying, oh, you know, God didn't really mean that. Well, God meant when he said that was, well, you know, he really meant this. And so you're now you're now you're in the very sad position of deciding what God meant to say. And once you say that once, everything is up to interpretation. You know, what you pick whatever a doctrine that you want to have, and if you allow that, well, God didn't really mean that. So we don't teach that, and, and that is just not possible. The only way to interpret the Bible is literally word for word. Um, uh, and here we have this phrase, they were cut to the heart. So, um, if the meaning in the Bible is obvious that they weren't, that it's not literal, then that's okay. They were obviously not cut to the heart. There's maybe 70, 80, 100 people in this room right now. All of them were not simultaneously cut to the heart. It just, it, the word means, it does mean, the phrase means literally cut to the heart, but it can be used figuratively to mean in agony, and we're going to discuss that more in just a second. Um, so they were they were cut to the heart. Um, in Hebrews eleven thirty seven, uh, they were talking about how the early Christians were treated, and um, from there we see they were stoned and sawn asunder. They were tempted. They were slain by the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented. So we see here um, the same phrase, the same cut to the heart, and here they, it, they were literally cut to the heart because we're talking about the, the early Christians, but it can be used figuratively also. Peter, preaching in Acts 2, he said this, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in the heart, and said Peter unto the rest of them, the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Now this is, again, it's an idiom, and it's also um, not literal because you can't reach inside someone and touch their heart. Um, and it's also not even the same phrase. Um, it's just, I'm just illustrating another idiom here. Now, the same thing is said uh, in Pharisee, by the Pharisees in chapter 5. When they heard that, they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay them. Note that enmity with God 
It's truly a heart cutting thing. Faith and love, now, those things are healing. So, uh, further on in our verse, we read that they gnashed on them. Now, when I first read this, I heard, I heard it say gnashed, but kind of in the, there was gnashing of teeth and wailing, that kind of thing. You see that phrase in the Bible, um, you know, every, every once and again. So I, I initially assumed that, but I, when I read it a little more carefully, I saw that it said gnashed on them. So I get the idea of these guys coming up and they've got, you know, they grab a hold of his arm and they are, and they, with that, I don't believe they did that either. Um, it, it's, it's more of a gritting of the teeth kind of thing, Arr, kind of a pirate kind of thing. Um, and so, you know, I like to illustrate things. I like to have pictures and sound um, because I think it helps the people, um, you know, just kind of get with, uh, you know, stay, stay attached to what you're saying. And, and so I started searching the internet for, for gnashing on. And what I got was people with their dogs, a lot of times small dogs, and they were they, they, the dogs were growling, and so they, so what they do, of course, is they take the cell phone out and they video the dog, and the dog standing over his food bowl, you know, protecting it, her little chihuahua or something, and I I, <laughs> I, uh, I want to be careful what I say on the internet, but I'm not too I'm not I don't take a dog growling at me very well. I would encourage the dog strongly not to do that again. So here I'm having all these thoughts about this encouraging of the dogs and I'm thinking, man, <laughs> I really can't say that sort of thing in Sunday school. That's not going to go over too well. So I scrapped the whole thing and I started searching for an image that I thought would, you know, would convey, oh, you know, gnashing of teeth and, uh, well, <laughs> in the end I never really found anything that I thought it worked all that well, so we'll just go. <laughs> we'll just go right past that. Um, notice great malice and rage that they have for Stephen. I mean, these guys are seriously mad. It's kind of mad that we don't come in contact with very often in our society. They're 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 murderers. They're about to take his life personally by hand. Uh, Job describes his enemies like this: He teareth me in his wrath, who hateth me. He gnasheth upon me with his teeth. Mine enemy sharpeneth upon his eyes upon me. That's a pretty, pretty accurate example. So I get the image of dogs. And uh, Peter here, I'm sorry, Paul here, he warns us about dogs. He says in, in Philippians 3, 2, beware of dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of the concision. Concision is, it's like the splitting or the separating. Um, so, not only do they have great malice and rage against them, but they have great vexation within themselves. And Psalms 112 kind of describes this type of torment. Psalms 112.10 says, The wicked shall see it and be grieved. He shall gnash uh, with his teeth and melt away, and the desire of the wicked shall perish. So, this, this evil causes a great torment within them. So let's keep on reading. I hope, I hope you're following me in your Bible. I hope you have a pen out um, and you're just following me verse by verse uh, because we really do want to get closer to God by getting closer to his words. Uh, verse 55, but he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. So those are, those are glorious, <laughs> glorious verses. You say, Brother Steve, why would you why would you go over those verses so casually because because you know we know you pretty well and you're kind of an over-the-top kind of guy <laughs> and i am i don't mind telling you um so why wouldn't you why wouldn't you just you know, i get this image of me um here trying to teach these verses and i got i've got i'm backlit and the light is kind of dimmed and i've got this halo effect going on and maybe <laughs> you know maybe a fan over here blowing blowing my robes and just looking kind of <laughs> Uh, but we're not going to do that. Um, we're, uh, truthfully, we're just going to come back to this. Um, uh, I, I'm talking right now about the persecutors. I'm talking about the people that persecuted Stephen, and um, and so I want I want to stay on that topic for just a few more minutes. Um, and I've got this really great outline going, and I know there's a couple, three of you out there, and you're like, man, I wonder how this outline ends. I'm writing, I'm hanging on the edge of my seat. So I want to keep you guys happy, and we'll just we'll just keep right on. <laughs> 
with this, with this persecutor's outline. Um, look at verse 57, and they cried out with a loud voice. So, so they, they, they cried out. So um, I'm thinking maybe 100 people in this room, because there's 70 in the council. The council is comprised of 70 of the elders, um, and there's always there's the two witnesses that are there. They were brought in. There's going to be some soldiers or some security kind of people, and there's always you know acolytes. Um, sycophants, people that are just there just to kind of be, you know, wherever they can. There's, we, you know, you see that in any place, there's officials gathered. So maybe a hundred people in this room. They cried out with a loud voice. And then, let's read just a little further, they cried out with a loud voice and they stopped their ears. So, you know, you kind of get the, uh, uh, I'm trying to wonder, trying to figure out how this uh, how this all worked, you know, the, um, how the whole stopping of the ears, because you got, they're crying out with a loud voice, and then at the same time, they're covering their ears, so you kind of get the idea of, you know, like a middle schooler who's going, you know, la, 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 and, and not wanting to hear your, your, your argument. Um, some people just don't want to hear. Um, I've been, um, you know, I've been soul winning, I've gone door to door, and when you, when you, when you speak to people, sometimes, you know, yeah, they've got what they want to know, and they, they just don't want to hear about what you have to say. They're just really not interested in it, they don't, they don't care. So it's just not going to make a difference. Um, it's just the way it is. Um, the, the psalmist mentions the deafness of the wicked. The, their poison is like the poison of a serpent. Serpent. They are like the deaf adder that stoppeth her ear, which will not hearken to the voice of charmers, charming never so wisely. So they uh, they, they, they stop their ears. So, so you remember. Um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about Stephen talked about them being uncircumcised in hearts and ears. Um, we gave some thought to the word heart, and I talked about it, you know, at, at some length. We talked about how they were uncircumcised in the heart. Um, Stephen um, said that God had given them a stamp. God had given them a seal in their circumcision. They were marked as physically marked as God's people, um, and all of a sudden. You know, they, he talked about them having an uncircumcised heart. They didn't have a heart for God. They weren't stamped in their heart. And here we see that their ears are also uncircumcised. They cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran on him with one accord. So they ran on him. Um, and I'm looking, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how this all works. You know, there's maybe a hundred people in this room and they, they all come at him. Now, I don't think it took a hundred people to carry Stephen away. He probably wasn't that strong. Um, but in, by, in, with one accord also means um, in unison in mind, that they all thought the same way. Every person in the room agreed that we need to take this guy out and be done with he needs to He needs to go away. So every last one of them in unison. So let's move ahead to verse 58. And cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the young man's feet, whose name was Saul. So, um, boy, we're gonna, there's, there's some things in here that we need to cover. First of all, they cast him out. So kind of get this, uh, you know, this, this, this idea in your head of how this looks like. Um, and there, they're going to they're gonna be all legal. Now, I think... I could be wrong, but I think that this whole this whole deal is more of an economic type of thing. Um, the Jews thought that the new Christians were going to be were going to ruin their their whole thing, the whole you know selling the doves and selling the spotless sheep. Because these people, this was a tourist city, Jerusalem, um, and all these people showed up from miles away, miles and miles, and they all came to worship at the temple. And all these merchants had these things set up. And if if the if Christ were to you know tear down the temple, oh, well, what would happen to our tourist trap and, and, and our and our economy? And uh, it scared them. They were they were just scared. They were um, it, uh, they they didn't know how they were going to eat if they didn't have this tourist thing going on. So they they fell back to the law. They found a reason to kill Stephen and they used it. So um, now, Pastor, on Wednesday night, just last Wednesday night. Um, he brought up a wonderful outline that I very carefully noted. And, uh, and Pastor, <laughs> I may be preaching this sometime soon. I don't know. It's a great outline. Um, Matthew 5 and 38, um, we see the law of retribution, which, which says an eye for an eye. That was the law at the time. You have heard of old times, an eye for an eye. Christ said in verse 39, he gave us the law of love. He said, turn the other cheek. 
Um, and then in verse 44, we get the law of Christ. Christ said, love your neighbor. Now, I, I really obviously can't do that outline justice here at this time. I don't have time for it, among other things. Um, but it's on the internet. You just look up Bible Baptist Church on uh, Wednesday night, uh, uh, and you will find that um, you'll find that that message. And it was <laughs> it was a good one. Um, they they pretend to carry out the law. So the law. What does the law say? Um, I'm gonna get kind of my um, get kind of in a, a, a an Old Testament kind of mood. And we'll put on some some Old Testament music here, and let's just kind of look at um, look at this Old Testament. Um, law that they're, they're they're putting forth Leviticus 24 verse 16 and he that blasphemeth the name of the Lord he shall surely be put to death and all the congregations shall certainly stone him um, and notice also in our in our verses that the witnesses go first um, according to the law Deuteronomy 17 and 7 the hands of the witnesses shall be first upon um, upon him to put him to death and afterwards the hands of all the people so thou shalt put away the evil from among you. So, um, and one other small, maybe not so small, um, thing that we see here is this verse introduces Saul quietly. One word, just a, a, a little tiny introduction. Um, I study cinematography. I'm not very good at it. Um, I don't have the creative sense to really do a good job, to really do anything like make a movie or, or follow a script or anything like that. Um, but I'm pretty adept at copying other people. And so uh, I, I read and I learn and I listen to what all these great people say. And one of the things they say is that you should have a, uh, a scene that, that, that introduces um, what you're talking about. You should have an establishing shot. That's the name for this deal. So, it, um, <laughs> boy, I'm embarrassed to even admit this. You ever watch one of those Lifetime movies? My, my beautiful wife loves, uh, she, she loves the, the Lifetime movies. So every once in a while we'll sit down and we'll watch one and they're all the same. Every single one of them, they have the same plot, the same, the same actors, um, and they have the same establishing shot. Um, the movie starts, there's a title, there's a couple credits, you get the name of the actors, and there's a, a drone shot of, of this small New England town. It's Vermont, I think, it's the same city every time. She doesn't believe me. Um, I'm usually right though. So they have an establishing shot. They, they start to tell a story and they bring in the view of the city. And I've long said that there's a couple reasons that uh, when the scholars look at the different reasons why the book of Acts might have been written, why did he write it? Um, and there's a couple, three, um, you know, reasons. Um, and the one that I like the best, when I, the list that I read, it was the third list, and, and indicating that the author of the list didn't really think it was the most compelling reason, but I do. Um, and it, that's that Luke was writing to, to beg for Paul's life. I think that he wrote the book of Acts um, to beg to, to, to this Roman official named Theophilus uh, and to beg for his life. Um, you know, the prevailing view is, because Christianity was so new, and, and they didn't know what to make of it. And these Christians, they're just gnats. They're mosquitoes that buzz around and cause a lot of trouble and cause a whole lot of commotion. And, and boy, they just don't seem useful. And how about if we just squash them all? Because that would save a lot of trouble and get back to the peace so that people can get back to sending us their taxes. Um, and so uh, Paul, uh, Luke is trying to write to Theophilus and say, listen, there's something to this. You should pay attention. Um, and he starts with an establishing shot. You, got, you wondered where I was going with that. He starts with an establishing shot. The first seven books uh, of Acts, um, he shows the, the, create, the, the, the new Christianity. He shows how it started, why it started. He shows their trials. He shows their successes. Um, and it, all in all, it's a great story. And imagine, please, what Christianity would be like without the first seven vers uh, books in the book of Acts. We wouldn't know how Christianity got started. We would just have Christ, we have the four Gospels, and Christ would die, and then all of a sudden Paul would be on a missionary journey. We didn't know why or what or how. We wouldn't know his backstory. Luke did us a huge, stunning favor by writing this book and making it available to us. It is really something that's worth, worth your study. So, establishing shot, um, and then here, um, at the very end, we see Paul listening to this. So. Let's keep on moving. Um, 
Paul, at the end of the book of Acts, says something interesting. He's, um, um, he's been arrested. He's on his way. There's a bunch of Romans that have a hold of him, and they're dragging him up a hill, and there's a crowd. And the crowd, oh, the crowd is not sympathetic. They're kind of angry, and they're yelling. And, and Paul says, please, let me, let me stop and let me tell them my story, because I don't know if they know my story, and I want to tell it. So he stops and he tells them the story, but in the middle of the story, he's telling them his bona fides. He's telling them why he, um, why he um, is a true Jew and at the same time a true Christian. Acts 22 and 20, and when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I was also standing by and consenting unto his death and kept the raiment of them that slew him. So, how did Luke get that story? How did he know to write down the stoning of Stephen? Because, now I'm just guessing, because he got it from Paul. I think the person who's really telling this story in Acts chapter 7 is Paul, and he's relating it to Luke, because Paul was the one that was there. Um, Luke wasn't with um, the, the, the apostles all this time. He shows up like halfway through the book of Acts, and we know, uh, we know why and when and how all that worked out, and there is there's some proof behind that, but I'm going to skip over it for right now. Um, I think Paul remembers this story. I think that he tells it to Luke, and then Luke relates it to us. So, the strength of Stephen. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God. This is verse 59. And they stoned Stephen and calling upon God, uh, Stephen calling upon God, not the persecutors, and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. So, again, set the scene. Um, you know, kind of get an idea of how this is, what this looks like. So there would have been an interior room where these men met somewhere in the city. The city wasn't that big, a couple thousand people, um, not, not a whole lot um, there. Um, and, and so they would have dragged him out of this room, dragged him through the streets, and there would have been a stoning place, because this was not the first time they ever stoned anybody. Oh no, they, they did this regular. Um, so there's a place, and there's a whole bunch of rocks right there that they had already used, that had already done their deed, you know, in times past. So, and, and then when they're walking by, oh, <laughs> they gather a crowd. Um, I know you've watched uh, like westerns, because you know I, I watch all the westerns, because because I'm a guy. And and whenever there's a hanging, well, they draw a crowd. I mean, people would show up days early to see a hanging. Uh, you know, they, the women and children would be out there playing, and they'd be barbecuing, and they'd just be they'd be having a time because a, a hanging was an event. And I imagine that a stoning was a similar event for these people. So there was been by this time there would have been quite quite the crowd. Um, God tells us that He blesses His warriors. First Peter four and fourteen: If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. Now, we're going to see the Holy Ghost in Stephen in just a minute, but let me remind you that we knew that the Holy Ghost was in Stephen from the moment that we met him, Acts 6 and verse 5. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and the Holy Ghost. Um, I, I have to tell you, Christian, um, that is what I want other people to say about me. Um, I don't want them to say that he's he's good looking because, I mean, goes without saying, obviously. Um, and I don't want them to say that he's bold or brave um, or that he's honest or true. I want them to say that he is obviously full of the Holy Ghost. I think that's as high a compliment as you can pay to someone. So. Okay, so now, let's go back to those verses that I glossed over. I know that two or three of you out there are like, are pretty mad that I glossed over those verses, but don't worry, I'm going to take care of you. We're going to go back and look at them. So let's look at God revealing himself to Stephen. Acts 7, verse 55, that he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven. So, filled with the Holy Ghost, uh, about to be stoned, and he looks up into heaven. Um, I've read some accounts of people that have been mugged or, or you know, something like that, and you've got someone who's pointing a gun right at you. You've got someone who's pointing a gun in your face, and those people say 
but I didn't see anything except the very end of the gun. They're, they're just, they're fixated on the end of the gun because it's about to end their life and they're worried about it and that's all they can think about. So I have that knowledge. Now these people, they can't even describe the person who's pointing the gun at them, even though he's only a few feet away, because the whole time they were looking at the gun. He, being full of the Holy Spirit, looked up steadfastly into heaven. He dedicated his suffering to God. So I, I want to kind of, uh, again, set the scene here. Um, there's, there's a whole bunch going on. The crowd is steadily getting bigger, and the crowd is angry. Most of them have rocks in their hand. They're pushing the witnesses to the front, and these witnesses um, have to throw the first stone um, because that's what the law says, and everything is getting very heated, and it's getting very crazy. And he says, Behold, I see the heavens opened. Oh, my. Oh my, that must have been something. Um, I wonder how this came about. I, mean, I, don't, I don't think I'm ever going to know, but did he suddenly have his eyes strengthened that he could see up into the third heaven? Because that had to be, a, I would imagine, a distance away. I don't know. Um, did he get a vision like Paul? Um, did he suddenly, he was able to see this sort of thing in a vision? Or, I don't know, maybe God was actually there. Maybe maybe God was just right there, right above the crowd, and he looked up and he saw them. I don't know. Um, I know that he saw them. Um, the, uh, the scripture tells us that, that Christ sat on the right hand of God, but we never, no one ever actually saw it. They saw God going up into the clouds. They saw Christ ascending it up into heaven, but they never saw him sit at the right hand of God. There's only a couple people that actually saw that. Paul saw it. And John saw it. Revelation 21, 2. And I, John, saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And he saw the glory of God, Jesus standing on the right hand of God, verse 56, and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Stephen saw God. Oh my, that, that breaks me up. Now, if you have a pen in your hand, and I, I really hope that you do, um, write down in the margin of your Bible, Stephen saw. Underline that word, saw. Stephen saw. It's only a couple times in the Gospels that someone actually saw. That's pretty powerful. And then, underneath that, write down Stephen said. Stephen said, out loud, what did he do? He told others, Christian, listen. Stephen saw God and he did what he did every other day of his life. He went around and he told others. Now I know that if you're in a church that does soul winning, I know it seems like no one is listening. I know it seems like you spend all your time all your wind, all your efforts, no one ever seems to listen. Paul heard. Think about that. Paul was standing there, he was guarding their clothes, the ones that were closest to Stephen. And he heard. He wrote it down. And it made enough impression on him that he thought it, thought it worthy to repeat to Luke later on. And just in, if you stay with me, in a couple of weeks, we're going to see him getting saved. And you have to know that this experience, that watching Stephen see God, has to be something that weighs on your heart, something that, that eventually will get in there. Verse 59, they stoned Stephen, calling upon God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Now, Stephen, in the presence of God, is not above praying stands there in the presence of God and he prays for himself. Think about that. Read that verse again. Lord, receive my soul. That's something worth, worth meditating on. Verse 60. And he knelt down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. In the presence of God, Stephen prayed for others. 
I can't imagine a more moving testimony that anyone would ever have. Now, um, I know that in my personal life, I have a person who is actively hurting me. Now, their actions, I don't think that they, they do it on purpose to hurt me, but their actions do cause pain uh, I, I, out of thoughtlessness, um, cause great pain. Um, and so, it, not too long ago, I made a decision that I wasn't going to deal with this anymore, and I this anger in my heart, and I was I put their name at the top of my my, my prayer list ahead of my wife, um, ahead of my friends, ahead of my class who I love dearly. Uh, I put this name right up to the top. Now, it, some of you might say <laughs> you probably paid they would get shot or something like that. No, uh, I know I don't. I, I pray for pray for good things. I pray for wisdom. I pray for patience. I pray for peace. I pray for all of God's blessings. Um, and that sort of thing, um, it can change your life. Um, that's what Stephen did. The, the people that were hurting him the most, he asked for God's favor for those people. And remember, this prayer is being mentally recorded by Paul. And later on, it did make a difference. And then, the closing statement in our, in our, in our lesson today, when he had said this, he fell asleep. And I looked up, just to do it, I looked up the word to sleep because um, just that's what I do. Um, and it has the meaning that you think it does. It means literally fell asleep and then they say figuratively he died. And that's what happens was he, he died. So what's coming up in our future study? Um, uh, Acts 1 through 7 um, is the establishing shot. And it talks a lot about um, John and Peter. Um, chapter 8 is going to be all Philip. Uh, chapter 9 is going to be the salvation of Paul. Um, 10, 11, and 12 are Peter because Saul, after he gets saved, he, he, he has to go away. He has to go away to his home city of Tarsus um, because, just let's face it, <laughs> just because you're saved, you can't go witness to the people that you were trying to kill. They're not going to be too happy about that no matter what. You, your testimony is kind of shot. So uh, Paul goes away, he goes to Tarsus, he stays there for a while, and then he begins a series of missionary journeys. And we're going to very carefully study all those journeys, and I thank God for the study. Let's pray. Lord, your, your study today has been powerful and moving. It's been beautiful. At the same time, it's been bold. So I, I, I pray uh, that you would take care of your Christians. Help us all to, uh, to get closer to you, closer to your word, and help us to grow, grow closer to you through the study. Love it. Thank you so much. Subscribe to the channel if you don't mind. Um, and hit the like button because it helps. And even more than that, I would love to have a comment from you to let you know, to let me know what you think um, of this time and effort that I'm spending doing this. God bless you. We'll see you next week.